Mozilla was founded more than 10 years ago as Netscape, one of the companies that kind of co-created uh, the, the web as we know it today, was going out of business. And the reason that Netscape went out of business is that they took up this concept of a web browser and gave the web a graphical user interface where you can access information. And they started adding a lot of like, interesting extensions to the web and really built the, the beginnings of the modern web as we know it. And another company came in and started to compete with Netscape on making web browsers, Microsoft. Microsoft made Internet Explorer. And back then, Netscape's business strategy was to make a browser and uh, give it away for free if you were using it for private, re uh, for private causes, but to charge you if you were a company and using the web browser. And Microsoft came in and did two things that really hurt Netscape's business model. First of all, they were giving away Internet Explorer for free to everyone and at the same time also along with Microsoft Windows. So a lot of people had an Internet Explorer available to them. And you didn't have to pay if you were using it for commercial reasons. So that was very bad for Netscape. But what was even worse, actually, is that Microsoft used this momentum to give their browser to a lot of people for free. And they started extending the web with proprietary extensions. So Microsoft started adding a bunch of technologies that only Microsoft knew how to implement to the web. A very famous example of that is ActiveX. ActiveX is a piece of Microsoft technology where you can use Windows and, and machine code uh, on the web. And only really Microsoft could ever implement that. And this was the second big problem for Netscape, that even if they wanted to compete, and even if they somehow found a way to compete with a product that is free, uh, as it was back then with Internet Explorer in their case, they would not be able to build a browser that could display the same content as Internet Explorer, because nobody else than Microsoft knew how to implement ActiveX. So these were really the, the two problems that caused Netscape's business model to fall apart. First, that it was that the web was becoming free. You could not really make money with the browser anymore. But also that the technology behind the web was becoming proprietary. It was no longer possible to compete for all the parties that wanted to implement the browser with making a browser, because only one company knew how to implement certain technology on the web. So in this context is when Netscape actually created the Mozilla Foundation. And the Mozilla Foundation was created with kind of two purposes. One was uh, to make a browser implementation open source with the goal to kind of leverage the open source community and make a browser that is free and open source. And then based on this open source Mozilla code base, Netscape then could go and make its own uh, browsers that they can somehow make money with. So that was the original business proposal. Um, that, was, that actually turned out to be not the most important part of the Mozilla's mission. Really, the key piece of Mozilla's mission was the second piece that for something like Mozilla or Netscape to be successful, the web has to be free. All the technology on the web has to be open, and everyone must be able to implement it. So the idea to kind of eliminate proprietary standards and make sure that the web only consists of open standards that are openly specified, and everyone knows how to implement those, that really turned out to be the, the core of the mission of the Mozilla Foundation. So. Over the last 10 years, Mozilla actually was very successful doing this on a desktop, as you probably know. So today, if you look at today, the, the web today, you have many different browsers you can choose from. You can use Firefox, and I hope some of you do that. But you can also use Chrome, and uh, you can use Safari. And actually today, you can even use Internet Explorer. And it's even, uh, even that is today a pretty respectable browser. And if you look at these different browsers, you can go with the same browser, uh, these different browsers with the same web content. You can go to Amazon.com with all these different browsers, and the page looks roughly the same and works roughly the same across all these different implementations of the web platform. That you can't do that, and you have the choice which browser you want to use on your desktop. The Mozilla Foundation was actually a big part of that being possible. And there's really two things that are behind that again. On the one hand, the concept of open source. So Mozilla went ahead and created a large open source community around the Firefox and Mozilla code base to advance Firefox as an open source project. But even more importantly, over the last 10 years, working with like other couple companies that make web browsers, Mozilla made sure that all the technology that you have today on the web is actually free. So all the, all the technologies that you need to build a web browser, they are documented somewhere as an open standard, and they are actually freely implementable by everyone. This is, what, this is what made it possible to have competition in a desktop space. So Google and Mozilla, for example, can both implement a browser. In Google's case, it's Chrome. In our case, it's Firefox. And they both render roughly the same web. And what we're competing with, or what we're competing over, is who implements it better. So it's no longer that 
they have ActiveX and we have something else and we can only render our part of the web and they can render only their part of the web. Instead now we have a web where everyone, this, everyone implements the same technologies and we compete over who implements them better. And this is what moves the web forward so, so amazingly. So over the last three or four years, JavaScript has gotten many, many times faster, probably 30 or 40 times faster over the last four years maybe. It's very unusual. In, in very few fields of technology do you, do you have a programming language become that massively faster over this short period of time. The reason for that is there's competition. All these different browser vendors are competing over, they cannot compete over who has a different JavaScript that only runs with their specific sites. That's no longer possible because everything is based on open standards. Instead, we are competing over who can run JavaScript the fastest. And that's what really is moving the web forward, that we all have to collaboratively come up with new standards and implement them and see who can implement them better. Now, as I said, on a desktop, this worked very well. So Mozilla succeeded the last 10 years creating a lot of competition and open standards on the desktop. If you look to mobile devices, it's unfortunately a very different environment. If you, pull, if you have a smartphone uh, with you today and you pull that out and you look at that smartphone, all the openness and the choice that you have on desktop, you do not have on that smartphone. It doesn't really matter who makes that smartphone for you. It's a completely locked-in system. The, original, the, the, the first original and really successful smartphone OS was, was iOS by Apple, right? If you look at that device, it is completely locked in. Everything on that device is made by one company, Apple. All the technology choices in that device, Apple has decided for you. Even the, the language you have to use is pretty much an Apple-exclusive language, Objective-C. All the other te technologies and Coco and Objective-C and the different frameworks you have to use, they're all defined by Apple. But it goes even further, not just the applications that you have to write with the device, you have to you write with Apple technology. The actual device experience is in large pieces also owned by Apple. The marketplace, for example, on the iPhone is owned by Apple. If you would like to have your application uh, in Apple's marketplace, you have to comply with Apple's rules. Amongst others, those rules say that you cannot compete with Apple. So making a web browser, for example, on iOS is very difficult. Uh, we know that firsthand. So Mozilla cannot make successfully uh, a web browser for iOS because there are certain rules that basically make it impossible for you to ever compete with the browser that's on the device. So it's a very different environment. It's completely locked. It's not the desktop. I cannot just like, take another web browser. Instead, it's a, a, a system that's locked in where the owner of the platform sets the rules and you have to comply with them. And unfortunately, this, this applies pretty much to any platform out there. So Android came a couple years after iOS, and supposedly it's an open source platform, but it's, it's really a very different flavor of open source than the way Mozilla understands open source. So Android is open source, but it turns actually out most of the time, if you buy a device, uh, but the moment the device really comes out, that's when the source code becomes available. So it's not really open in a sense where we understand open source. If you take the Firefox OS project as an example, for example, how Mozilla understands open source, we started the project a little bit over a year ago. And we started the project, by, we made an announcement, we said we, we really think there should be a really open, a web-like uh, operating system for smartphones. And we would like to start developing that. And we created an empty repository that was public up on the web. And we said, this is where we start developing this. And it was literally empty when we created it. And then we put engineers onto the project and started building it in the open. This is very different from that Android is being built. So Android is, is in the end, very much like iOS proprietary technology. It's developed inside Google. All the technology choices inside Android are decided by Google. Google decided to use Dalvik. Google decided all the different APIs. And it's all being done inside Google. And then the only difference between iOS and Android really is that when Google starts selling the first phones, then after they have done all the innovation and technology decisions, then they go and publish the source code. But we don't really think that that's the same degree of openness that the web has. Because if you look at technology on the web, it's actually a very different process. Individual companies like Mozilla or Google cannot just go and add technology to the web. That's not how it works. Instead, what we can do is we can propose. For example, um, until very recently, there was no way to make phone calls on the web. And um, that's one of the reasons you could not really build a smartphone with the web. You can, so you simply could not dial numbers or you could not take incoming phone calls. So how, does this, how do we overcome this on the web? On these existing platforms like iOS and Android, Apple or Google would just go and define an API and say, this is the API, you must use this, go. On the web, this works very differently. So Mozilla actually does not have the power to do that. Mozilla cannot simply decide 
what the what APIs on the web look like. Instead, what we can do is we can propose something. So Mozilla has over the last 10 plus years a lot of experience proposing new APIs for the web, since that's one of the main things we have been doing. We have been finding things you cannot do with the web, and we have added ways that you can do that. So we actually sat down with a couple of partners, including Qualcomm and Telefonica, uh, and a couple of other OEM and chipset vendor and um, carrier partners. And we, we sketched out what we think an API for telephony on the web would look like. And usually the next step you do after that is you actually go and implement a prototype. So a lot of the APIs that you uh, will see today or learn about today in, on this device, they are actually prototypes. We proposed what we think an API should look like, and we submitted the API as a proposal to a standards body like W3C. And in parallel, we've actually implemented it because we don't really want to wait until the standard is ready. So the web actually works very differently than traditional telecommunication standards, for example. In many areas in the telephonic, telecommunications industry, you have committees designing a standard first, and then people go and implement it. The web moves much, much faster than that. So this entire device, we have built most of the device that you can see here, the new technology in there is, has been built for the last year. In many cases, it takes lower than a year to standardize technology. So the web is just moving so fast, there's no time to wait for all these parties to agree. What we do instead is we all implement prototypes. So Mozilla proposes an API for telephony, and we implement it. And then there might be another uh, browser vendors interested in it. For example, maybe Google at some point would like to use the telephony API for Chromebook. Then Google would go ahead, look at the API, and implement their version of it. Often it's very close, because there's no strong reason to disagree on the API as long as we make a reasonable proposal. So in some cases, there's just minor differences. And these minor differences will then be then sorted out as part of the standardization process. So the goal is really to go ahead and actually very quickly iterate to the standards and make proposals and move the web forward very quickly. In, in more practical terms, actually, on this device that we are um, talking about here today, many of the APIs on the device over the last year, they started with a proposal and very quickly gone into a proposal out to W3C and then discussed by W3C and also implemented by other vendors. For example, the battery status API. Around the time when we started this project a year ago, there was no way for a web application to query the status of the battery, like how much energy do I have left, how much time is there left um, in a device. And if you build a device with the web, you have to be able to access all the device status and device capabilities with HTML. So all the user interface parts and everything else in this device implement this HTML5. If you have a smartphone and a status bar on top of your phone, that little battery indicator is HTML5 code and somehow it must get to the battery status. This specific API a year ago didn't exist. So we actually went and, and found that someone already tried to propose a pro possible API for the battery status. We took that API and we implemented it in our boot to gecko system and we refined the proposal and then very quickly, over a couple of weeks, the proposal then went to W3C and was discussed there. And then actually Samsung, one of the OEMs in the mobile space, went ahead and implemented the API in WebKit. And uh, maybe two or three months late after that, WCC actually passed the battery status API as a final standard, uh, as, a, as a recommended standard. So today, the battery status API actually can be found in many phone implementations. And we are actually also shipping it across our desktop products. So on Firefox uh, desktop, on a laptop, for example, you can read the battery status. It's the battery status API. So what this, this example shows you is that it's possible to move the web forward very quickly, but we have to do so in a collaborative way. So all the technology that we talk about today, all the new standards we talk about today, they're not proprietary Mozilla standards. Mozilla can propose something, and we can start the implementation process. But in the end, the final version of all these standards will be done collaboratively between a number of different parties, including all the different browser vendors. So this is really the key difference between the desktop web and these kind of proprietary systems, that nobody owns the desktop. Mozilla does not own the, 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 the desktop web. We more like care for it. We, we add new technology, we propose new technology when there's holes missing, and so do other parties. So some of the new APIs that we have implemented in this system very early on because we needed them, we actually didn't propose ourselves. Another important API for this mobile phone case is what we call the visibility API. So you want to know whether your web API of your web app is being visible right now or it's in the background. It's really important for to save battery. Yes? 
Um, Oh, wrong ones, yeah, okay. Actually, no, I will, I will skip in a second. So for, for visible APIs, it's very important to um, distinguish whether your app is visible currently or, or is not visible. And that API actually was not proposed by Mozilla originally. It was originally proposed by Google for Chrome. And they proposed an API, and Chrome implemented it initially, and we saw that API, and we really liked it. It, it fit very well into what a need we saw, so we immediately adopted the API. So this is also an important part of the web, is that when there's a proposal being made by someone that's reasonable, it's a good API, and people can see that it makes sense, then people go ahead and actually implement that, even if it's not their own proposal. There's a certain market pressure behind it. So this is what really creates alignment on the web. It doesn't really matter whether Mozilla proposes a new API or Google proposes a new API or Microsoft. As long as the API itself makes sense and fulfills an important need, everyone will roughly move to the right direction because in the end, we all want the web to move forward. So on a desktop, all these things have worked very well. Really what this project is about is taking the same approaches and the same methods, like making new standards, making sure it's open technology, using standards bodies like W3C, all these things that have worked very well over the last 10 years, we would like to apply all these things on, onto the mobile phone space. And we'd like to build a device that works exactly the same way the desktop works. So the goal really is to make devices where the web is the core technology in them. And as a result, all the technology choices are open in this device. And this is the only way how we can basically break free of these silos that currently exist on smartphones. So really the goal of the project is to basically make sure that the same things that have succeeded on desktop also succeed on mobile. So the, when we launched the Boot to Gecko project, um, one of the first choices we made is that we wanted to, there are certain parts of a, tele, of a phone system where Mozilla is uniquely qualified to provide a lot of interesting um, extensions and different technologies being used today. But there's also a couple parts of the system where it's not, where we are, simply don't have as much to contribute. So for example, um, when we built this system, one of our key goals was to make sure that all the technology that's facing the developers is completely open and free. So a lot of the things that you hear about today about HTML5, every piece of the user interface of the system that you see is implemented in HTML5. And that's really important to us. There's no proprietary APIs in that. So all the things that you implement in Gaia or user interface are in, in pure HTML5. As you get further down in the stack, um, some of the control there is a little bit different. So for example, this device, uh, to make a successful telephony uh, device and a smartphone, you have to support certain protocols, telephony protocols. So it was not really our goal to redefine the way telephony works, for example, or to redefine the telephony protocols at the bottom of the stack. What was important to us is to redefine really the developer-facing and the user-facing parts of the system. And the goal was really to address three different, uh, three different use cases for that. First, we wanted to make sure that the devices themselves for the parties that live in this ecosystem are customizable. So for OEMs and, and, uh, and, and, and operators such as yourself, we wanted to make sure that you have the ability to use open technology to modify these phones and bring customized user experiences to people. Then, of course, for developers. You, many of you as web developers, our goal was to make a system where you can use established HTML5 technology and new proposals and standards to really bring the uh, application experiences to, you, to users. And then finally, uh, last but not least, it's also important for users to, uh, to break apart these silos. Now, we'll talk about that in a minute, why that's the case. So when, when operators and developers want to extend these devices, and they do this in kind of different ways, but in conceptually, it's very much the same idea. They both want to take some code and deploy it on these devices. And there's slightly different mechanisms at play, but in the end, um, in existing smartphones, using this, they're very much the same approaches. So if you have an operator or an OEM, and you would like to take an Android phone, for example, and customize it, you have to take some Java code, and you have to exchange some parts of the system. And there's some APIs you can use. And you can use it to customize. So Vivo can put some specific code or specific extensions for the Brazilian market, market onto these devices. When you do that, you have to use Google proprietary languages and APIs to achieve that. Very similarly, if, if you're a developer, you would like to develop an application for Android. In the end, what you're doing is you're writing some proprietary Java code with some proprietary Google API, and that's going to work on Android only. 
The disadvantage is it's not going to work anywhere else. So if you'd like to make an iOS application, you have to go and like rewrite the whole thing in Cocoa on Objective-C. And then if you want to make something with Brew, you have to go and rewrite it in that again. So all these different platforms, these proprietary platforms, they usually use their own technology stack and they're completely locked in. And if you invest in one of them, you, your investment doesn't really translate. You have to redo all the things all over. This is pretty much the same for operators and developers. The goal is to, one of the main benefits of HTML5 is that it can basically run across all these different Godot's categories. It doesn't necessarily run equally well everywhere. So as you see some of the demos here, you will see that on this device, you have a lot more capabilities in HTML5 than, let's say, on an Android or iOS device. So on this device, you can do with HTML5 things you could not do until recently, especially not on mobile devices. But in general, HTML5 is actually portable across all these devices. So you kind of get both of the, the best of both worlds. You can, make, you can write applications that run across a wide range of devices. They might not run equally well, and you might not be able to use Bluetooth or USB or the radio across all these different devices because many of the proprietary stacks run web applications but don't run them as well as we do. But at least the basic app experience you can uh, display across all these different devices. So depending on the kind of applications you are writing, this translates actually quite well to all these different devices. And if you're targeting HTML5, you can basically use the app across all these different devices. As there's at the same time also a very interesting uh, benefit for users out of this. If you're a user and you go and, and buy on your Android smartphone, you buy a game. Let's say you, bought, you just bought Angry Birds on your Android phone. And you really like that. Um, and you yeah, actually uh, maybe even have paid some money for it. It suddenly locks you in very subtle ways into this platform. Because now if you don't like Android anymore, if you'd like to upgrade to iOS or to some other, uh, other phone system, the apps you have bought, the content you have purchased on your Android phone are now locked into the Android phone. And they're locked into there for two reasons. First of all, the marketplace you bought them from is the Google marketplace. So they're locked in the marketplace because Google is the one who sold you the application. They're the one who gave the receipt and the right to use the application. And the, the, those receipts and the right to use from the Google marketplace does not translate to the new Apple marketplace. You have to go to if you switch to iOS, for example. But even at a deeper level, actually, the application you purchased is written in Java and Dalvik and, and a couple other like Google technologies. So the application itself simply doesn't really translate. And even if there is an equivalent uh, application, it would be completely a different one on the iOS device. This is also what's very different with HTML5. On these, uh, on these Firefox devices or open web devices, if you purchase an, an application that's a, that shows you news content, for example, if you use responsive design, which Philip is going to talk about in, a, um, in one of the later sessions, you can create content that you can consume very nicely on these devices. And we can sell you the web app to a store. And then you can go to other, to other devices where you can consume the same content. And if they have a bigger screen, the, your app is going to adjust very nicely to the bigger screen, and people can consume the content there. And this goes all the way to the desktop. If you log in on your desktop in Firefox, in future versions of Firefox, you can run web apps directly in the browser. They will be started as a separate window. And you can take the same news application. It can run in the browser as well. So people can take the content with them. If you purchase content once somewhere, since it's built on HTML5 and portable across these different devices, once you have purchased the content, it can follow you around. You're no longer locked into any of these platforms. And ultimately, what this also means is that you're not locked into Mozilla's platform either. So you can take your HTML5 application with you. And in the future, when people start building HTML5-based phones with other systems than Mozilla's code base, you can still take your applications with you because you're not using any Mozilla proprietary code. What you're really doing, you're writing for the web and for open standards. And that can follow you around. You're not locked into some Mozilla ecosystem.